Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar titled, How Any Business Can Be Turned Around Using Lean, presented by Art Byrne. My name is Dwayne Butcher with Lean Frontiers, and I'm both honored and excited to bring you today's webinar. Before we begin, just a few important announcements. If you have questions during our time together, you can submit them using the GoToWebinar toolbar. I will field these questions and ask them at the end of our time today. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available for playback in the hours following the webinar. You can look for an email from me with a link to that recording. Also, a copy of the slides uh, that Art will be using today will be made available. You can again look for an email from me shortly. Well, let me introduce today's presenter, Art Byrne. Art is an operating partner with JW Childs Associates where he leads the implementation of lean management at Child's portfolio companies. Art began his lean journey as general manager at the General Electric Company. Later, as group executive, he helped introduce lean to the Danaher Corporation. And then as CEO at the Wire Mold Company, he quadrupled the company size and increased its enterprise value by 2,500% in less than two years. Art is truly one of the Lean's pioneers, and it's a real treat to hear from him today. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Art. Art? Well, th thank you, Dwayne, du and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, as uh, Dwayne said, this is really going to be kind of a presentation of my book, the Lean, recent book, The Lean Turnaround. Um, I wrote the book really with a simple purpose in mind. I've been doing Lean probably longer than most people in the U.S. and have learned a lot over the years and my simple purpose was really to pass on that knowledge to as many people as possible and hope that I could encourage other companies down the lean path. My own lean journey, as uh, Dwayne mentioned briefly, <clears throat> started in January of 1982 during my first general manager job at the General Electric Company. Uh, my manufacturing manager had recently come back from a trip to Japan sponsored by GE's corporate manufacturing group at the time. And he and a, another group company whose alt manufacturing guy had also gone had to do some sort of um, uh, project and present it to, to corporate manufacturing six months later. So they decided to do a simple Kanban system between our two businesses. Uh, I was the customer and the other guy was the supplier. The, we were in the lighting business, so uh, they were supplying arc tubes to me uh, we were making outdoor uh, high-pressure sodium lamps with them, and so these arc tubes are pretty expensive little items, and we basically just bought a little van, created some Kanban cards and a box for each, uh, each box of arc tubes was a Kanban, and started delivering them. Uh, within no time, my inventory went from about 40 days down to three. Eventually, my supplier uh, inventory disappeared altogether, and <clears throat> the thing that we really noticed was that, gee, quality improved, the space was freed up, um, productivity got better, people were happier, the shop floor was cleaner, lots of side benefits, and my customer service was better than it ever had been before. So I was really hooked on this and really decided to continue this in anything that I did, therefore, going forward. Um, <clears throat> leaving GE and going to Danaher as a group executive, I was fortunate to run into uh, the Shinjujitsu Consulting Company. We were their first uh, US, consult, U.S. customer and were their only U.S. customer for about four years. And the principals, was only three guys at the time, uh, all had worked directly for Taiichi Ono in, in Toyota for many, many years. And Taiichi Ono, for those of you that don't know, was really sort of the father of the Toyota production system. So we were learning from the, uh, the horse's mouth, if you will. Um, they, were, they were teaching us a lot of things. They, they called themselves insultants, not consultants, because they were just tell us to do things, and if we didn't do them, they'd get pretty mad at us. Um, so we had great success at Danaher, and then when I went to uh, Wiremold, uh, we did a very, very good lean transition there. It wasn't two years, as Wayne had mentioned. It took us about 10 years, but uh, we did quadruple, more than quadruple the size of the company. We increased operating income by over 13 times, uh, and we got an enterprise value increase of about 2,500% in just, just under 10 years. So um, this stuff really does work. Uh, but given that quick background, 
you can see that I've always done lean from the position of a CEO. Uh, and as a result, I never looked at lean as a bunch of tools, which unfortunately is the way that a lot of people seem to look at it. Um, I always looked at it from a business perspective and as a strategic perspective. So the, the book that I wrote is not a lean tools book at all. It's really a business book, and it's a, a book on, on leadership. <clears throat> when you look at it in a simplistic way, any business is, is really simple. It's a, a bunch of people, a bunch of processes, all aimed at trying to deliver value to the customers. Uh, the customers are, are the same for you or your competitors, so at the end of the day, the best team always wins. The traditional approach that we've taken to this uh, challenge over the years, however, is, is uh, pretty much always backwards. Uh, I hate it when I hear companies say that our strategy is to create shareholder value. To me, that doesn't make any sense at all because shareholder value is a result. It's not a strategy. It's a result of what you do over long periods of time. Uh, and so to, to say that that's your strategy is to, is to me totally backwards. The other key thing that most companies do, for whatever reason, is they take their value-adding activities as a given. You've probably all been in a situation where you say, well, that's the way we do things here. Or it's always going to take three hours to change over these machines. That's been that way for 30 years. Or we always have a six-week lead time, but so does everybody else in our industry. Those kind of things are an example of taking your value-adding activities for granted. And when you do that, you therefore have to construct your, your strategy and stuff to get customers to sort of conform to you. Uh, you know, I'm sure you all have suppliers that when you want to buy something, they tell you it's an eight-week lead time or a 12-week lead time or whatever it happens to be, and there's nothing you can do about that if you, if you happen to need that. And, and if all their competitors are also offering that same lead time, then you're kind of stuck. But... That's kind of how we look at it. And then, of course, the main thrust, and, and this was driven home to me very strongly during my, my time in General Electric, which was, you know, make the month. At, at the time I was there, it was sort of make the month or die. Uh, that was a, there was a very, very strong thrust on that. And I think most companies still do it that way. Um, but, in the, but value is really created in different ways. It, it's created by improving your own value-adding activities. If you do that, you're going to be able to deliver more value to your customers than your competitors can. And if, in turn, you can conform what you do to your customers, you're going to have a strategic advantage. So, you know, the, the real way of creating value is sort of the exact opposite of the traditional approach that people use. I always like to use this particular term, that productivity equals wealth, as an example of, of what I'm talking about here. This is true for countries or companies is true over you know many many years you think about the industrial revolution uh, for for England back in the in the 1800s or so that was that was really caused by productivity gains that they got over time some through inventions and some through better ways of doing things and the reason that the US has risen to be such a strong power over the last hundred years or so is really the same thing it's through productivity gains and the only way that companies uh, grow and prosper, et cetera, is the same thing. It's through a series of productivity gains. And if you, if you get productivity gains, you have the ability to create wealth, wealth for all your stakeholders, uh, et cetera, uh, but only if you have productivity gains. If you don't get productivity gains, you're not going to create any wealth, or certainly not over any period of time. So you need some sort of an approach that will allow you to do to, to generate consistent productivity over long periods of time. And lean strategy is, I think, the answer. Lean strategy allows for big improvements in your value-adding activities. And this creates growth and gains in market share. Um, so, you know, when you think about that, lean is really the greatest wealth creator that there ever has been. People don't think of it that way. They think of it as a bunch of tools or something. And you know, if, if you have gains in your value and activities, the, the ability to outperform your competitors uh, it, over a period of time is going to be pretty, pretty dramatic. And this is going to give you growth and gains in market share, and even in down economies like we have right now. So lean is a, a perfect weapon for this, this kind of an economy. And, 
based on the recent election, I don't see this kind of economy getting any better for at least four years because the, you know, the, the policies and stuff, the anti-business approach is still going to be in place. And I can't see us growing very fast. So the more productivity you can get, the more gains you can deliver to your customers is the thing that's going to allow you to grow. But unfortunately, you know, we, we when we first were introduced to, uh, to Lean, uh, we first knew it as just in time. Back in 1982 when I started, uh, you know, we first knew it as sort of quality circles, then it was kind of just in time. Eventually we called it the Toyota production system. And then it wasn't until 1996, I think, when Womack and Jones wrote the book Lean Thinking that we started to use the term lean. Now, we managed to take these two terms and lean thinking certainly described uh, the, the concepts and the approach needed uh, in a very, very clear way. And they made it uh, clear that it was really a, st a strategy, not a bunch of tools. But somehow we took this and we turned the concept of just in time back when that was the term that was used. People said, well, you know, just in time, that's the thing that Toyota is doing to reduce its inventory. And, you know, as a result, we whenever you heard the term just in time at, back then, you always heard the, the word inventory afterwards. People would just say, oh, you mean just in time inventory. And then, of course, because people <clears throat> never could believe that you could actually take the inventory out of the whole value stream or the whole supply chain, uh, then it became just in time inventory, go beat the heck out of your suppliers. And what they meant by that was, gee, if you can't take the inventory out, of the whole street or the whole value chain, then somebody has to hold it, and in order for you to reduce your inventory, you have to force somebody else to hold it. So, go beat the heck out of your suppliers, and that's the way we kind of thought about that back at that time. <clears throat> Some of the big three automotive companies uh, had a lot of sway over their over their suppliers because they were so big, of course, uh, and they and they really pushed this uh, concept very very hard. Uh, to their own detriment, I think, because they, if you remember back in those days, they tore up contracts, they did everything to, you know, to change the price and to get themselves an advantage, but over the long term, it didn't help them very much. And then we took lean thinking, and we turned lean thinking into lean manufacturing. And I think that today, that's really what, if you mention the word lean, if you said to somebody, oh, we're doing lean, uh, the response you're going to get in most cases is, oh, you mean lean manufacturing? And you know this is this is what, how it's become known, and and as a result, I, I think this is a terrible tragedy, um, because what happens when you call something lean manufacturing? First of all, it tends to focus it as something that's for only for manufacturing companies. Uh, this tends to eliminate a lot of other companies that can really benefit even more than manufacturing companies can from this. You know, places like hospitals or banks or um, service companies or anybody who's not doing manufacturing, I think can get much more gains out of lean than manufacturing companies can. But when you call it lean manufacturing, they look at it and say, well, we don't want to do that. We're not a manufacturing company. And so we, we limit the scope of what can happen here by what we call it. And then even in manufacturing, when you call it lean manufacturing, the manufacturing people say, oh, that's lean manufacturing. So that must be something that my manufacturing people should do. And I'll just assign this lean business down to the VP of operations and let him go ahead and do what he can do. And you know that's, that's the way we'll approach it. And that's unfortunately how most people look at this. And I would say you know, it's hard to pin a statistic down, but it wouldn't surprise me that about 90 to 95% of all CEOs see lean as some manufacturing tool. It's something that they want to use to cut the headcount or reduce their inventory, maybe help them with lead time a little bit, but it's just a manufacturing thing. Uh, as a result, I, I look at this as lots of companies are trying lean. The, I don't know what the percentage would be at this point. Uh, maybe 35, 40% com of companies have either tried something in lean or have done a little something with it or are thinking about it, etc. cetera. Uh, but the truth is not too many are very successful. It isn't that they don't have some successes. It's just that they never are successful enough to become really lean enterprises or lean companies, if you will. Uh, and what I was hoping to do with the book, The Lean Turnaround, is really to show a path 
that uh, companies can use on a consistent basis to be successful uh, using the lean approach. One of the premises in the book is that if you're leading a company and you don't want to dramatically improve your results, then you're in the wrong job. That's, you know, maybe it may sound a little harsh to you, but um, I, I think that that's really true. And you'd be surprised over the years, the number of CEOs that I've sat down with and said, well, gee, you know, here's the kind of things and results that you can get from lean. And you go through this big list and they all look at you and say, wow, that's amazing. And then the next breath they say, but you know, we're really busy right now and we're putting in a new MRP system or we got this other thing going on, blah, 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 blah. So I don't think this is really for us right now. So I, I look at it and just say, well, gee, you know, if I can show you great results and I can tell you that everybody that applies it the correct way is going to get these kind of results and you're not interested, then why are you running the company? Why are you the head person? Why are you running that business if you have no interest in improving it to levels that are you know, quite a bit better than you're doing right now? And for example, if you look at it in a generic way, this, is, this would be sort of my generic list of what you can expect from lean. And because this has happened, I've seen this happen in almost every company I've been involved with. And most of the lean consultants that I know or people that are working on this every day would give you a very similar list. But you know, if I said, look, you can cut your lead times from weeks to days, you can, you can double your inventory turns in a couple of years and quadruple them in four. You should be able to get annual productivity gains of 15 to 20 percent. Uh, back in my Danaher days, one of the first companies we started uh, really down the lean path was a company called Jake Break. And you know, as we moved along in Jake Break, I think Jake Break sustained something like 29% productivity gains year after year for about seven or eight years in, in, at the beginning. And oh, by the way, that was a UAW location that we started leaning in there. So, you know, th this is not a, a pie in the sky kind of thing in terms of what productivity gains you can get. Uh, you should be able to get a 50% reduction in defects every year should be able to reduce 50% of your space in about two years. Uh, you should be able to improve your gross margins by, I think, four to, four to eight percent is a pretty good target. Uh, working capital as a percentage of sales should be cut in half. Uh, and you could increase your growth by taking market share. My experience over a lot of years in a lot of different businesses is companies that, before we started lean, <coughs> were growing one to two percent. After we got lean uh, implemented and moving along, maybe three three years in, uh, all of a sudden we're growing at 10 percent, and the reason was really just that when they were growing at one to two percent, they were they weren't very good suppliers. They had long lead times. They weren't responsive to the customers. And as we cut the uh, cut the lead times and improved the quality, et cetera, the inherent growth rate, which was closer to 10 percent, just sort of popped up and, and there it was. It was there all the time, but, but they weren't performing to, to get that. So you can get better growth. And at the end of the day, if you create a Kaizen or team culture, uh, you're going to become very difficult to beat. Because when you, it, when you try and become a lean enterprise, the real objective that you have is to imply, imply, you know, employ lean as your strategy but eventually to get it to become your culture. Because if you get to where lean is your culture, you're going to be extremely difficult to be. Now, that's a sort of generic list of what can be done. Uh, this is what we did at Wiremold over the course of 10 years. We took our lead times from four to six weeks uh, when I first got there to like one to two days pretty much across the board. We had a 162% or better productivity improvement. Uh, we improved our gross profit from 38% to 51%. That's a that's 13 points of gross profit gain. Now think about your company. Would would you be happy if if we could get to a 13 point gross profit gain? Wouldn't that be something that would be worth trying to do this for? Um, we took machine changeovers from sort of three per week to 20 to 30 per day. The reason we could do that was we dropped almost all of our setups dramatically. Uh, for example, when I first got there. We, we had a lot of different kinds of equipment, a lot of punch presses, a lot of progressive dies and, and that kind of thing. We had uh, punch presses 
that were that were taking two and a half to three hours to change over, and we got those down uh, someplace between a minute and, and three minutes probably, and and so you know at three hours of changeover time, if you change three times per week, you lost a whole shift worth of production. Um, but at a couple of minutes of changeover time, you know we could change in twenty to thirty times per day and not lose much of anything. And so it was a very, very dramatic uh, difference when you when you drop your setups like that. We had injection molding machines, uh, two-hour setups when I got there, and uh, by the end we were changing those injection molding machines with one guy uh, in one to two minutes on a consistent basis. Uh, we had a rolling mill that started out a uh, 14-hour changeover. We got that down to six-minute changeover. So you know, there's a lot of dramatic things that can happen here, but you have to just think about it the right way. Our inventory turns went from three to eighteen times. Customer service, which was dreadful when I first got there, while lead times went from fifty to ninety-eight percent. We more than quadrupled the sales. Our EBITDA grew from six point two to twenty point eight percent. Our working capital for sales uh, fell from twenty-two percent down to just under seven. Operating income, as I said, improved by thirteen point four times and our enterprise value increased by just about 2,500 percent over this period of time. And um, you know, if if I can present you a list like this, and and you say, well, I'm busy, I have got something else to do, then I, I I just I'm always flabbergasted by that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But you know, if I show you these results, and your your basic reaction would be, gee, why isn't everybody doing this stuff? And you know, I go back to our early work with Shinjo Jitsu. Uh, at Danaher, and myself and George Konensaker, who ran Jake Break and worked for me at the time, uh, we were having lunch one day with Yoshiki Iwata, who was the head of Shinjujitsu, and uh, you know we said, "Gee, Mr. Iwata, you know th this is this is the Toyota production system. Th this is the most incredible strategic weapon for any company that we've ever seen. It's just incredible what this can do for you. And why is the why is Toyota allowing you guys to go out and consult and, and do this stuff and teach other people? And he just looked at us in this sort of fatherly way and a nice smile on his face, and he chuckled and he said, "Well, look, you know, I can tell you about lean, uh, uh, Toyota production system. It wasn't called Lean at the time. I can tell you about the Toyota production system. I can even take you places and show you the Toyota production system at work." He says, "But I bet you can't go home and do it." And that's that was really a prophetic thing, I thought, because he's he was right at the time, and he's still right today. That that's something that's very difficult. This isn't easy. It's easy for me to tell you about this stuff, but it's really hard to do it because it takes commitment, it takes time, it takes a lot of energy, and it takes a lot of management to do this. Um, <clears throat> but you know, a lean strategy can can turn around any business. That's the real point of my book. Is that this isn't just a manufacturing thing, but it can turn around any business. If you, you, but you have to have a few things in place. You have to have a proven approach to how you're going to go about this, which I'm going to walk you through here in a minute. And part of that that uh, a, a proven approach is really you have to have two key ingredients. One is you have to follow three simple management principles, which we'll cover in a minute, and you have to adhere to what I call the four lean fundamentals. And at the end of the day, you'll find that that even if you adhere to those two things, that, that leadership is going to be the key to whether you're going to be successful or not. The three management principles that I just mentioned are, are, are very simple. You have to first of all see lean as the strategy. You have to lead the transformation from the top. You can't delegate this down. Uh, the CEO has to be sort of upfront, hands-on, and, and very, very involved. And you also have to understand that this is that, that Lean is all, all about people. You know, a few slides ago we said that companies are nothing but collections of people and processes trying to satisfy a group of customers. And so if you think about it, the, the thing that you're really trying to transform here is the people. And you want to get the people involved. You have to change how they think and how they work. Um, and so that really has to be your focus. But what, what I find is that people that think of lean as a bunch of tools, they, they, don't, they just think they can ignore the people. They think that this is like putting in an MRP system or some new computer system or something else that's going to solve the problems for you, some what I call a, a silver bullet solution. But I, but I think that if you don't 
follow and adhere to these three management principles, uh, at the end of the day, you're going to fail because they're, they're very, very key foundation to any ability to, to implement lean. Let's talk about lean as the strategy. Uh, the key is you, you want to focus on your processes, not your results. Now, this is the exact opposite of the way most companies are trained and the way most companies are run. We close the books every month. We spend you know days or a week analyzing those results. We have meetings about those results. We try and manage those numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, it, it, it's a struggle. And you know, some people they have they have bad months in operations, and they try and offset it with a great month in accounting. And as a result, uh, you know, you have things like Enron, WorldCom. Uh, Health South and a bunch of guys that went to jail because they had uh, way too good results in accounting uh, to offset the, the results in operations. So, you know, when you have lean as a strategy, you got to focus on your processes and focus on where you're going, not where you've been. Um, <clears throat> the, the better your value adding, uh, by if you focus on your process, you're going to improve the way you do value adding, and the better you do value adding, you're going to increase your strategic options. Uh, for example, if you've always ignored your value adding activities and you've always accepted the fact that you have a six week lead time to make product A, um, then you're sort of stuck with that and you've got to construct your strategy around it. But if you improve your value adding, you say, well, it's not acceptable to have six week lead time for product A. I, want a, I would want a one day lead time, I want a two day lead time. If you if you get to a one or two day lead time, and the rest of your competition is it's still at six weeks, you've got an enormous strategic advantage over the other guy, and you can start to offer two or three day lead times when he's still offering six weeks. I can guarantee you, you're going to take market share, you're going to take it at full price, and you're going to start to grow, and you're going to start to hurt the other guy. So, better out value adding means that you have the ability to create new strategic options that you didn't have before, and you know, therefore, you can think of lean as really a time-based growth strategy. It's sort of a sequential thing. If I if I reduce the amount of if I reduce the amount of uh, uh, time it takes me to change over something, and I cut my lead times, then <clears throat> what's going to happen is that uh, uh, I'm I'm going to have the ability to to do things faster and respond quicker. And if I do that then I'm going to have the uh, uh, ability to, <clears throat> to, to gain market share and to grow. So lean, you really have to think of it as sort of a time-based based growth strategy. And that improving your value-adding activities is really sort of the core foundation of your strategy. It doesn't mean that when you adopt lean as your strategy, it doesn't mean that you should stop doing all the other strategic things that you've always done. You want to expand your market, so do this, so do that. You can do all those things. It's just that you're going to be able to do them faster and better quality and lower cost. And so it just increases your strategic capability. Uh, leading from the top uh, is, is really, really key. The, the leader, in my opinion, is the key to this whole thing. Without the right leader, I used to tell people that if you can't get your CEO involved, then don't even start this. In fact, when at Wiremole, we got a little famous because we were when Womack and Jones wrote the book Lean Thinking, they included Wiremold as a chapter in that book. And once that happened, we became a chapter in Gemba Kaiser, and we became written up in a lot of other articles, all that kind of stuff. So we had a lot of people coming, wanting to come and do tours of Wiremold, and we felt kind of obligated to do this. Um, and we were getting kind of busy doing these tours, and so we said, you know, this is kind of crazy that we know that these companies, unless the CEO is involved and unless he's going to drive it when he goes home, uh, none of these guys are going to do anything when they go back home. They're just going to, uh, you know, they're like industrial tourists. So we said, look, let's just put in a simple rule. And the simple rule was that you can still come into a water mole, but you can't come unless you bring your CEO. And guess what? All the tours stopped right away. They absolutely stopped. And it was fine. We needed to get back to running water mold anyway, but it's just an, it just gives you an idea as to how hard it is to get the head of anything to, to participate and, and make the change. But if you don't have that leadership, 
it's very difficult to make progress. You're trying to transform your people, and people are very resistant to change. They're, they're not interested in changing what they've done the same way for 20 years. And so the leader has to be the one to convince them. And the way to do that is to lead by example, of course, to be out on the floor, to be in the workplace, to be showing people how to do things. And the lean leader doesn't have to start out being a lean expert. I certainly didn't. Uh, and I know most of the other people that I know that have really been successful with this didn't. But, but you have to commit to being one, because to becoming one over time. <clears throat> because if you don't, how are your people going to follow you? If they don't think you know what you're talking about, if you don't understand th these concepts, then it's really hard to get people to follow you. And the best way to become a lean expert is to learn by doing. This was something that the Shinja Jitsu consultants uh, hammered into us over time. And we went on a lot of Kaizans. We spent a lot of time with them. And they were correct. If you, if you didn't do it, um, you couldn't learn anything. So the leader is really the key in this. And then transforming the people. If you think about your people, it's the only asset that you have that appreciates over time. If you train them, if you get them thinking differently, et cetera, if you have somebody who can only run one machine, um, versus I have somebody who can run 15 different types of machines, I have an advantage in my people. I've trained them. I've given them more skills. And it's better for them as well. Uh, the other thing is that you have to respect your people. You know, one of the key tenets of the Toyota production system is, is the concept of respect for people. And I, I look at this from, we, I never knew that that was one of their tenets for a long, long time. We, we just automatically respected people because we understood that the best ideas on how to improve your value-adding activities are going to come from the people who actually do the work. So you want to get them involved, you want them to participate, and they're always going to give you the best ideas. You, you therefore want to get them involved, you want to create a learning environment so everybody's learning things all the time. One of the best ways to do that is to get people on Kaizans and have them spend a lot of time on Kaizans because uh, a Kaizan is a pretty focused, concentrated thing and, and you're going to learn a lot in, in that period. Uh, I always think of the organizational triangle, if you will, that we draw. We say, okay, the CEO is on the top and then there's the VPs and then you go down to this level and that level and then down at the bottom. You have all the, all the workers. Those are the value-adding people. So I think you ought to really invert that triangle. And the value-adding people ought to be at the top. And anybody below that that's not working and spending time to make the job of the value-adding people easier every day are, are just a form of waste. And if, you can, if organizations can think of it that way, I think they're going to go a lot further, a lot, a lot faster. So as I mentioned before, the concept of lean and continuous improvement is really to get it to where it equals your culture. And transforming your people is the only way you can do that. Now, the second key thing I talked about was you have to, you have to always push and drive home the lean fundamentals. <clears throat> These are pretty simple. I'm not going to go into them uh, in any detail here. Uh, we could spend an hour on this. But uh, the, the four of them are work to tack time, one piece flow, standard work, and pull systems. Work to tag time is something that doesn't really exist in batch manufacturing, per se, or in, in most companies. It's the concept of time available versus demand, so that it's bringing the customer into the equation. Uh, one piece flow, of course, is, it eliminates, you know, it's the sort of key to quality and the key to productivity. Standard work is really establishing a floor and a base so that the way we do the work is done the same way all the time by whoever does that. And it also establishes the floor from which we can get better. If you don't have a standard, how do you know if you got better? You know, you, you, you just don't know. Um, and then, of course, the final thing, and you, which you're not ready for until you do the top three, is a pull system. It's, it's crazy when I watch companies head into lean, they mostly think of it as a bunch of tools, and they think they'll select the tools that they kind of like and start to use those. So, you know, they all want to select the full system right away. We're going to start with Kanban when Kanban can't work unless the top three things are in place. You, you can't pull against a batch. It doesn't make any sense. You know, the Japanese wouldn't even let us touch Kanban for about three years, I think, when we started working with them. So, but these lean fundamentals are really the building blocks of your turnaround. If you keep driving these into your organization and pushing people down this path, um, you, you're going to be very, very successful. Now let's start down the path of, okay, how are we going to run through this and how are we going to do it? 
First of all, there's a little upfront work. You need to articulate your lean vision, which is going to be your strategy, basically. And then you need to figure out how to obtain the lean knowledge. If you don't, if you have never done this before, you need lean knowledge from someplace. And I would suggest two things. When we started, we couldn't go out and hire people to populate a Kaizen promotion office because there weren't any lean experts out there. My only choice was to use a lean consultant. Now, with my portfolio companies, we try and use both approaches at the same time. We bring in a lean consultant. We try and hire some outside talent to create a lean promotion office, and then we're attacking it from both the inside and the outside. Uh, the other thing that would be helpful is to lean, add some lean expertise to your board of directors because <clears throat> if you start down this path and your board of directors are a bunch of batch guys, you're going to be fighting them all the time, and that's, that's not a lot of fun. Uh, let's talk about the strategy part. This is the wire mole strategy. I'm going to go through it kind of quickly, but um, it, you may not look at it as a normal strategy statement. The, the, the approach of what we were trying to do was a vision, if you will, was to be the leading supplier in all the industries that we served and be one of the top ten time-based competitors globally. Now, that second part, pretty hard to measure, but it basically said we were trying to compete on time. We were trying to reduce the time it took us to do everything because we knew that would give us competitive advantage. And in order to think about operational excellence and competing on operational excellence, we had to sort of define what it was. So the first bullet here, number one, constantly strengthen our base operations, was kind of how we defined that. We, our internal targets from day one were 100% on-kind customer service, 50% reductions in defects per year, 20% productivity gain each year, 20 times inventory turns. We were at three when we started, by the way. And visual controls and the five S's. And we used those five things to basically run the company. We didn't really spend a lot of time on uh, month-end financial reviews. We had to close the books and give numbers to the banks and stuff, but we didn't really spend any time internally. We spent all of our time internally reviewing these five items every week with, with the team leaders, et cetera. So this is the way we ran the business. And then because we were new, if we got a 20% productivity gain, you're going to start to free up a lot of people. You better have something for them to do. So we needed a growth element to this. And so we, our objective was to double in size every three to five years by using QFD to introduce new products quickly and to pursue selective acquisitions. And you know our target, we just set this arbitrarily, double in size every three to five years. But the way it worked out, <clears throat> the first doubling occurred in the four years. The second doubling occurred four years after that. So we were right in the middle of this target all the way through. <clears throat> Adding some lean expertise to your board of directors, this is an example from one of my portfolio companies. Um, <clears throat> this was a company that didn't want to, didn't, wasn't doing lean, had no interest in it. I got on the board and started pushing it. My partners were uh, also on the board, and so we, were, we had the whole board pushing lean. We got an ex wire guy in as the head of operations, and we started to make some progress on this. And what happened was this, and this was over a maybe a three-year, two-and-a-half, three-year period, three-year period perhaps, we, inventory turns went up <clears throat> almost triple. Working capital to sales dropped in, in half. <clears throat> Customer service got way, way better. We gained six points of EBITDA margin, and we freed up $65 million in cash from working capital. And, when we sold it, we got a three and a half times return on our investment. So this worked out really well. Um, <clears throat> when you get started, uh, you know, you, you, one of the things that I see companies try and do is drop lean on a traditional organizational structure. Everything's set up for batch, and we're going to just drop lean on top of it. But that's never going to work. To do lean correctly, everything you do has to change. Every part of your organization has to be on, ball, on board. I would create a value stream organization up front because I think that that helps to shake this up a little bit. And if you know, because most companies are probably 25 to 40 percent um, overstaffed to begin with, I think you should consider a reduction in force uh, before you begin. At Wiremore, we did this, and we we dropped headcount by about 30 percent right off the bat. It was a, we we had a uh, an early retirement option, and a lot of people took us up on that, and that was fine. Once you establish your strategy and, and you get your organizational set, I think the next thing is really, you know, you, you want to go full speed ahead. The CEO should really be the one that makes the announcement and should do the initial training. It's way different just to have the CEO say, okay, we're going to go down this lean path, and here's Harry Smith from our consultant. He's going to tell you about it, 
and the CEO leaves. He comes back at four in the afternoon, he, and he stands up at the end, and he says, wow, wasn't that exciting? And everybody says, what are you talking about? You, you weren't even here for the day. So I think if, if the CEO is involved and he's doing the training, he's picking the early Kaizans, he's setting the stretch goal, <clears throat> et cetera, you're going to get a lot further much faster. And Kaizen should be, the, the value and in the, in the power of Kaizen is that it should be a full-time job for the week or for whatever period of time you're going to run it. A week is sort of this, a, sort of a standard, if you will, but you can have a, one that lasts longer. You can have one that lasts a little shorter. Uh, but the key is people on a Kaizen should be full-time on that while they're doing it. It's not something where you come together for a meeting once a week and, try and put together a plan. It's a doing it exercise. <clears throat> um, you want to, you know, you want to focus on cutting setup time, freeing up space, creating flow and pull, that kind of thing. And you want to, you know, one of the things if you're in manufacturing, you want to think about is I look at inventory as the root of all evil because it's the thing that's hiding the waste. So you you want to be really pushing to get rid of that. What kind of results should you expect in a typical one week kaizen? Well, here's a pretty good list right here. I, I won't read this to you, but I think you can. I'll give you a second to look at it yourselves. But I've seen this repeat many, many times. And the bottom line here is really the key, which is as you start to move these things and you get a pull system, you can connect your customer right to the shop floor directly through a Kanban card, where most companies, they on purpose don't connect the customer to the, to the shop floor. They, they disconnect them, and the shop floor just makes a forecast. <clears throat> Lean leadership. Uh, is really the key. The, the lean leader has to be, in effect, the company's lean zealot. Have to keep making the case for change and, and uh, make it over and over. Got to get everybody on board or let them go. You're going to have a few concrete heads that need to go. Uh, I would suggest implementing policy deployment, a Hoshin Conry up front. That was a great planning tool. It would help you a lot. And the key is that you, you know the, the lean leader has to establish the discipline daily management at the point of value adding and then support that going forward. He also has to be able to take the leaps of faith in things to overcome the law that exists in almost all companies. Um, and you have to be willing, you have to understand that, you know, to keep this going and you're going to company in your company, you're going to create your future leaders and they have to all be <coughs> lean people as well. Uh, if you looked at standard work for a lean leader, it's really sort of set the direction, build the capability to solve problems at the root cause, support process improvements through daily gimbal walks and KPI reviews, uh, and then identify the breakthrough opportunities and set the stretch goals, and show respect and support for all associates. These are pretty simple things, but most people don't do this at all. What you're really trying to do is if you have a thousand people on the payroll, you want to be getting improvement ideas from all, all a thousand not just from the top 25 or so that you've been using over the lot of years. <clears throat> the other thing is you want to dump the stuff that will hold you back. You know, this is the concept of everything has to change. Uh, most companies, for example, have a standard cost accounting system if they're manufacturing. I look at that as sort of the anti-lean because it's trying to, <clears throat> you know, all the things you're trying to do in lean, the standard cost accounting system is incentivizing the exact opposite. It incentivizes the building of inventory, for example. Then traditional measurements, things that, you know, I watch a lot of companies and they'll measure things like direct to indirect hourly. Well, that's nuts. It's, it doesn't help anything and it creates a lot of bad behaviors on the shop floor when you do that. Tickets, tickets, tickets just means that as we move from batch to flow cells, we got rid of <coughs> move tickets, labor tickets, routings, and a bunch of other paperwork on the shop floor that we no longer needed. Uh, big end of month financial reviews. When I was in GE, we would spend an average of probably seven to eight days every month reviewing the prior month, going to the meeting, getting beat up, all that kind of stuff. What was the point of that? That's all a waste. You can't do anything about last month that already happened. Uh, and then major capital appropriation request processes. You shouldn't really um, have to do much of that. You should be thinking with your brain, not not with your wallet in the first place, but if you need to do capital appropriation requests, it should be less than a, it should just be one page, and you should have done forced a lot of kaizans to happen before you even brought up the idea of spending capital money. 
The next thing is, you know, as you're moving down the path here, you, you want to try and leverage lean in the marketplace. How are you going to grow and gain market share? Uh, you know, new products uh, are a key element here. As you get lean and you get better and better at what you do, and you can move faster than QFD, which is quality function deployment, which is a methodology for introducing new products faster and cheaper, and mass customization are a couple of things that you can do to set yourself apart from your competitors. Um, you can work with your customers to reduce the amount of your inventory that they have to hold. Um, this, this sort of ties them into you a lot very tightly because if they want to change suppliers, they're going to have to add a lot of inventory that you help them take out because the other guy can't perform at your level. <clears throat> you want to lower the cost of their doing business with you in every way you can. You want to try and level incoming demand. Uh, this is going to allow you to, to return value to your customer if you can level their incoming demand. Um, you want to leverage your customer's measurements. The, we used to, at Wiremole, we sold into the electrical distribution industry, and they used uh, GMROI, which is gross margin return on investment, as a measurement. And <clears throat> basically, they would compare suppliers on that. And so if we could get them to increase their inventory returns of our stuff, our GMROI measurement would shoot off the charts and we'd be seen as a, a, a very good supplier, whereas uh, we couldn't really move the needle too much on their gross margin because they just put 25% on everything and so that, it, you really couldn't affect that. But you could really affect the inventory returns part of it and that helped a lot. Uh, the other thing is to think about delivering value to your vendors as well because you know that's going to help them get on board and you know, you, you want them to deliver every day, and that might mean you have to go over and help them do some setup reduction so they can do that for you, teach them how to put Kanban cards on your stuff that they send to you, et cetera, et cetera. But it ties you in, and it links you back into your value chain in a way that's going to increase your speed and your competitiveness. Uh, I always like to tell a story about the coming back fee. I had one of my portfolio companies at, uh, at uh, Danaher when I was a group executive, we were screw, screw, Swiss screw machine manufacturers, and that's a pretty easy industry to get into. There's a lot of small guys, and the average margin in that industry is probably two or three percent. And we were making over thirty percent, and it was because the guy that was running it was a, quite a character, but he was a very good operator, very focused. And every so was, every every year, people would have some customer that would say, you know, I can go down the street and I can get, I can buy this product that you're selling me for twenty percent less. And he would always say, well, I agree, you probably can, but don't forget the times that I bailed you out when you were going to shut your lines down, when I ran Sunday, Saturdays and Sundays for you, when I, I had, you know, I never had any defects, blah, blah, blah. He goes through the whole list of the value he provided. And the guy would say, well, I, I hear all that, and I really appreciate it, but 20% is a big difference. I'm going down the street. So he would just say, okay, uh, I, I can't stop you from doing that, and I'll let you know that I'm going to be here if you want to come back would welcome you back, love to have you as a customer again. He said, but you should know that if you go down the street and you find out that they don't do a good job and you want to come back, that I charge a 20% coming back fee uh, for the first year that you're back. And the number of people that went down, and he used to itemize the coming back fee on the invoice for the first year. And they'd just pay it because they understood that the lack of a 25% part, they didn't want to shut their line down. Um, once you get pretty good at this and as you're going, you should be trying to capitalize on your gains. Uh, one of the things is you should have profit sharing of some kind for everybody. This should be something that comes off a of dollar one, not some convoluted formula that says, gee, if you get to the budget, we'll share you know, some percentage over the budget with you. Uh, because that, that's a kind of fake thing because you're going to keep moving the budget up every year and people know that you're not serious. Whereas if it comes off a dollar one, it's real and it's it's something that really incentivizes people. People really get involved when you have a profit sharing plan. We had one at Wiremold that worked great. Um, <clears throat> the right lean management incentive program I think is important. Uh, and what I mean by that is is that you need to incentivize your balance sheet as well as your P and L. The formula that I've used very successfully over a lot of years, I used it at Danaher, I used it at Wiremold, I used it at my portfolio companies is a formula that's 40% of your bonus is based upon 
uh, earnings, whether you call it pre-tax profit or EBITDA, whatever earnings number you use, 40% is based upon working capital terms, and that's a 12-month moving average working capital terms, and 20% is based upon implementing key strategic items. And these strategic items need to be difficult things. They're not things that are simple layups. They have to be something that's meaningful and significant for your future growth, et cetera. But if you have that formula in place, you'll find that people respond to it. They do things automatically that are good for you. Uh, that if you just had a single earnings only measurement, uh, wouldn't necessarily occur. And then, you know, you want to leverage your your newfound lean state in, in things like acquisitions. We we did 21 acquisitions at Wiremold, and you know we have basically sort of standard work for this uh, as, as to how we went about it. But you know, lean in acquisitions gives you three advantages over your competitors that are trying to buy the same company. One, it provides the cash for you. The second thing is it it'll lower the risk um, of, of doing the acquisition because you're going to get your money back faster. And the, the most important thing is I think it creates a clear game plan for everybody. You know, I watch companies do acquisitions, and a lot of times, particularly bigger companies, bigger companies aren't really good at acquisitions in my mind. They, they tend to come in and they, okay, we bought this company, we're all excited, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to study them for six months or nine months, and then we're going to figure out what we're going to do with them, et cetera, et cetera. With, with Lean, we, you know, our standard work was the first day the acquisition closed, myself and Maybe a couple other people went there. Uh, we got all the employees together. Now these were small acquisitions; these weren't massive companies. But we got everybody together. We said, uh, you know, we we just bought you, and welcome to Wiremold, and and now you're part of our profit sharing plan, and and here's a nice T-shirt or something, and let's have a cup of coffee. Now, come back from coffee. We're going to have a two or three hour training in in Lean. Then we're going to go to lunch, and after lunch. We're starting our first couple of Kaizans right here this week, and we'll stay here for the rest of the week doing Kaizen. And by the end of the week, we were moving equipment around. We were changing things. We were, you know, the point was at the end of the week, the new company understood that, gee, these, these guys are serious about this. Look what they've done already. And so we better get on board and, and, and work on this. And when you did that, uh, acquisitions became, uh, became pretty easy to do. So the other point that I've tried to make with this book, uh, besides how do you go about implementing this, is that lean applies to any business. Lean gains are bigger, in my opinion, in non-manufacturing companies, but they're a little harder to get because, you know, manufacturing, you can go out and look at the process. In most uh, service type companies, it's hard to see the process because it occurs on people's desks and they're very protective about what they're doing and all that kind of thing. But you know, I, I've experienced this in hospitals, life insurance companies, distributors, et cetera. Hospital is a great example of Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. When they first started Lean, they sent 30 of their top people, or they, they, they brought 30 of their top people, CEO came and everybody came, to Wiremold for two days. And we said, look, you know, we're, we're no different than you are. We take a piece of steel or a piece of plastic we run it through a process, we punch holes in it, we attach stuff to it, we put it in a box, and we sell it. You uh, take a human body instead of steel or plastic, you run it through a process, you punch holes in it, you attach stuff to it. You're not allowed to put it in a box, but you can put it in a car and send it home. And, and so, you know, they kind of chuckled at that, but they got the point. We spent a couple of great days showing them how our processes worked, how we drove things through. Um, Ten years later, uh, Virginia Mason, I think, is probably the leader in uh, implementing lean in hospitals. And I could take you through a long list of all the different things that have occurred and the, the gains that they've gotten. But the bottom line for them is that 10 years ago, um, they were ba barely, barely break even. And, and today, they make 40, $42 million in profit. So um, it's quite a big change for them. Um, the other, the other uh, industry that's, that's, that's big on most of it, that they haven't done much, but the opportunities are very big, is life insurance. I helped the life insurer in, in, uh, in Connecticut uh, uh, to work on this one time, and they were they had an underwriter was underwriting about 15 lives per week. We got that up to about 88 lives per week. The time it took to do the underwriting went from 48 days to under 20 days. Uh, and all of this costs no money 
at all. So, oh, here's here's some of the Virginia Mason numbers that I mentioned. Uh, yeah, but and you can just see the bottom line here of you know going from 700,000 in 2000 to 41 million in 2010. That's a pretty significant gain, and lots of uh, you can read the list there. Lots of great things happening uh, as as they did that. Um, a distribution warehouse example. This is an example where headcount went from 16 and a half to nine and a half, down 42 percent. They freed up 35,000 square feet of space, saving 180 grand in rent every year. They increased the number of picks per 10 feet of rack from 9 to 42, and they reduced the shipping areas by 90 percent. So, you no, know, this is something that works everywhere. In summary, uh, I think the the thing that one of my teachers, uh, Mr. Nakao, used to always tell me was, said, you know, Bernstein, if you don't try something, no knowledge will visit you. And that's really, really true. And that's really what Lean is about. It's, a, it's, it's trying it, being convinced that you can get success and have gains. But if you don't try it, you'll never be successful. So Lean will provide you unfair competitive advantage if you do it correctly. Um, and hopefully this book will help a lot of people uh, do it correctly. So. That's the summary. I'm, we've got a few minutes for questions, I think, but we're pretty close to our time. So, Dwayne? Yeah, thanks, Art. Uh, some questions did come in, so let me run down, do a few of these. Um, you mentioned in the beginning uh, that you established Kanban between businesses. Uh, this person is asking if you might be able to expand or maybe give an example on what, what you meant by that. Uh, I'm not sure what... what the what do, you, what do you mean by Kanban between businesses? Um, <laughs> I, we, we, you know, our Kanban was really uh, <clears throat> not so much between businesses, but just a, a, as a full signal from the customer in into the factory. Uh, we, for example, at Wiremo, we had every time that the customer order reached one Kanban level of any product, that printed a Kanban card directly on the shop floor. Uh, we didn't have a an MRP system to run the shop floor. We ran it all off a Kanban system that came directly off the customer orders. And that's what it meant by connecting the customer to the shop floor. Okay. Yeah, without uh, being able to interpret what they meant, my, it sounds probably like well, what they were looking for. Yeah, I mean, if you think about most businesses, they, they purposely disconnect the shop floor uh, from the customer. They force the customer into some sort of order entry system and then they they produce on the shop floor based on another system, which is really, you know, a forecast. The, the, the shop floor produces to a forecast, not to what the customer wants. And the forecast is aimed at trying to anticipate what the customer wants. And the two systems are totally separate. If you do it correctly and with a pull system, you can connect that customer's order as it comes in throughout the day directly to the shop floor throughout the day. And so you're not wasting any things that the customer is not ordering. So it's, a, it's an enormous difference. Okay. So another question came in here. Uh, if you were leading uh, a company that had a high mix, low volume business, how might you approach that differently or, or would you? And, th and this person puts out an example that they have uh, custom equipment that varies greatly in size and complexity and the uh, customer demand is unpredictable. So how might you yeah. address that? <clears throat> Well, I, I think that that type of company benefits more from lean than the standard product type of company because, um, they, you know, as, as you improve the flow and the speed with which you do things, you gain tremendous advantages over your competitors because they're wrestling with the same issues that you're bringing up here, which is, you know, how do I deal with the complexity and do it smoothly. Um, but, you know, the, the way you do that is just to, to not let, N not let the complexity get you. Think about what you want to do. You want to have a smooth flow. <clears throat> you want to have one piece flow. You want to have quick changeovers, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you set it up that way, even though it's custom, you're, you're only customizing certain parts. Maybe, you know, you're not customizing everything every time usually. And even, although I have seen that happen where Kanban cards with cu everything was customized, we're still going through in a one piece flow. So. The advantage to that type of company is, is, is very great. I think there's more gain in that type of company than a, in a standard product company. Okay. Um, so this person is asking, uh, 
what, what type of resources in terms of personnel do you need to employ lean uh, throughout an entire organization? Okay. Um, well, first of all, the CEO or whoever is leading the business doesn't have to be title CEO. It can be owner. It can be plant manager. It can be, you know, division manager, whatever it is. That person has to be the leader and has to be out front and hands on. You need to support that with a value stream organization so that it's, that, that's, that's aimed around, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, your value streams. I'm sorry, I don't know how to shut this phone off. That's, <laughs> that's all right, Art. I, I, I'm just going to let it go in the voicemail, but it, it, you're going to have to let it ring. Um, and you know, and then then the, the Kaizen Promotion Office would be the other support function, along with maybe an outside consultant. And for size, I would I, I think of a Kaizen Promotion Office of being if you can have that the size of maybe two to three percent of your sales force over I mean of your workforce over time. That's probably an adequate size for a Kaizen promotion office. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Well great. Uh Art, we are just uh, a minute or two over time, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap things up. I wanna thank you for your insights. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Art's experiences and his insights, uh, you can be sure to pick up his uh just published book, The Lean Turnaround, How Business Leaders Use Lean Principles to Create Value and Transform Their Company. Uh, perhaps this is uh, a Christmas gift you could purchase for your CEO and maybe anonymously give. Um, so Art, on, on behalf of my company, Lean Frontiers, and lean practitioners around the world, thank you. Thanks for not only today's presentation, but for but really your pioneering efforts in in uh, this lean business model. Your example's been, and I know it's going to continue to be, uh, kind of a standard that organizations try to achieve. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, you're welcome, and thank you for having me. I hope uh, I was able to help somebody or, or two. <laughs> okay, great. So you can look for an email from me in the, the next few minutes with uh, links to the recorded webinar as well as the slides that Art went through today. So thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. And have a great day.